six years ago, I preached this message to you. It was uh, as I was getting ready to say goodbye. And a lot of water has gone under the bridge. And I feel more strongly about this message than even I did six years ago. I'm preaching it for myself, but I'm also preaching it for a lot of my dear friends here. Um, I th think of the Wes, uh, Kim's mom, as she was leaving today, stopped me and uh, she just, she started crying and I told Kim, she said, I, Brother Spencer, I, I'm sorry I'm not more faithful to church. I, I wish I was doing more. And I, I put my arm around her and said, you have nothing to apologize for. I said, you're a, you're a picture of faithfulness. And that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. But I'm also preaching this to what, this sounds bad, but we're not electing a president tonight. But I want to preach this to the walkers, too. I don't know if they've ever heard this. But I want to remind you that God, does ne God never intends for His children to quit. We all feel like it from time to time. But Paul, who is uh, next to my Savior, my hero, I love Paul. In chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, and we'll look at most of the chapter, he literally from his own heart shares the secret. Not so much a secret when you learn it, of why he was at this point in his life not willing to quit. And so the title of my message is How Not to Quit. There's five thoughts. Start with me in verse 1 and then get down to verse 7. He says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. When you see that word faint here and later, it literally means to quit, to stop. Look at verse 7. But we have this treasure. Now, brethren, that word treasure goes back to verse 1. He considered serving Jesus Christ a great honor Amen. and a great treasure. He says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. There's not a, a man or woman in this room. And if you feel this way, get up tomorrow and see what happens. But the phrase earthen vessels literally was Paul's way of saying, the glorious call of God and the glorious salvation he's put in me. We all need to admit he put it in an earthen vessel. The phrase earthen vessel literally refers to something that is fragile, worthless, just a cheap instrument. And the older you get, the more you realize just how fragile we are. Amen? Amen. Why does God choose people? Why did God save people like us? And then why would God tell us not to quit? Look at that next phrase. That, or in order that, the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. The first thing that Paul shares with us tonight is that if you and I are going to keep going and don't faint, don't quit, you and I, like Paul, must realize, number one, that what God does in you is far more important than what's happening to you. Yeah. Now, that's a long, my, my other points aren't that long. You, and I'm going to show you this all the way down through verse 11. Paul said he, the reason he will not quit is every day of his life, he realized that what God was doing in him, while things were happening to him, he learned, you know what? What God's showing me inside of me, and what he's doing inside of me, is way more important than what's happening to me. Well, we get that backwards, don't we? We don't stop long enough when we're going through pain, or we're going through... Uh, a traumatic experience. Listen, first time in all my ministry, Brother Coom, I'm about ready to do the Lord's Supper. And a key family just runs. I mean, 
I'm picking on the Kim, but Kim went out first, and then he Ed leaves there, and he's he's trying to get around two guys in the doorway. And I thought, man, I know some people don't want to take the Lord's Supper, but I've never seen anybody try to get out that fast. You know, all the way driving. I'm sure the West probably thought, right, Ed? How fast did our life just change? And in the six years, when I first was here, there's things been happening to us. Things will. But when you and I, we get our focus on what's happening to us instead of what God's doing inside of us, you're going to be, you're, you're going to be tempted to quit. Look what Paul says in the next verse. Now, notice these couplets. He says, we are troubled on every side yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. The word troubled, the uh, word troubled literally means to be pressed on, but he said we're never distressed. In other words, we're, we're, we're never finally put in a corner where we can't get out. He said we're perplexed. That means to be in doubt, to not know what to do, but he said we're never in despair. That means to give up. No resources. No hope. Paul said we're persecuted, which means to be made to run or flee. But he said never forsaken, which means abandoned. We're cast down, which means to be thrown to the ground. But he said we're never destroyed. You know, the truth is, Paul goes on to say, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Number one, if you and I are not going to quit, we've got to remember it's what God is doing in us. That's much more important than what's happening to us. There's a pastor, he's with the Lord now. He died young, in his 60s of MS. But um, he uh, wrote in his own commentary, 2 Corinthians, which I treasure. He said, most of us Christians are dull of hearing. We're slow to learn God's ways. God's ways of working for us is when he seems to be working against us. So you see, the best time in your marriage may not be what you think is the best time. The best time may be the struggle. You're going through to work character in the both of you so that your marriage is stronger than ever. Great marriages are not made at the wedding, nor on the honeymoon. Great marriages come out of working through conflicts. The best time between you and a dear friend may not be when you're getting along, but when you're in disagreement. For it is when you can learn to get along and stay together and keep a friendship when you disagree that you cement a relationship more uh, tightly than ever. The best time in your life as a church member may be when you are unhappy in your church, when you can't stand the preacher. Because God is then doing something in you and for you that cannot be done in times of agreement and smooth sailing. The two, most the two most fruitful times of my life as far as producing eternal values in me were the first year of my ministry after which I was voted out of my church. It was a difficult time. But oh, what an appreciation of people that time worked in me that I as a pastor could not trample on people to get what I wanted as a pastor. I learned out of that experience to lead people where I wanted them to go, not to drive them. The second most fruitful time was a period after my operation, after returning from the Mayo Clinic, when I honestly thought I had a short time to live. I learned in that difficult period to appreciate my wife and my family and my church and friends and the value they have to me. May I say unto you, you do not learn valuable truth in times of cheap thrills and shallow mountaintop experiences. David said, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy word. Jacob said, when his sons came back from Egypt with terrible news, all these things are against me. But you see, he did not know at that very time. God was working out his family difficulties. That is why we must learn, if we would not faint, to treasure our afflictions, to welcome them as friends because they work in us and for us more value than anything else can. He's with the Lord now. He died, in my opinion, at my age. He would have been in his 70s now. Uh, last time I saw him, he had to be carried up to the platform at our college in a wheelchair and he preached strong. 
some of you, you've gone through very difficult things. And we might face some more. But listen, don't you quit. You're not going to get any permission from this, this apostle tonight. I'm not either. But remember number one, Paul's so-called secret was to remember that what God does in you is way more important than what's happening to you. Number two, look at verses 12 through 15. Resolve to live your life for others. If you're not going to quit, you've got to learn to be resolved to live for other people. Verse 12, so then death worketh in us, but life in you. We, having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken, we also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the, th for the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. Paul's just saying it this way. I've learned that the same power that raised up Jesus is the same power that's keeping me going. And the power that God gives me to keep going is nothing more than for you. Most Christians live a selfish life. You know the people that, uh, and, and, and guys, um, I'll just admit, there are times in my Christianity I've been selfish. And those are the times that I've looked back. I've been, I thought about quitting. But when you live like Paul, and you say, doesn't matter, God, what's been happening to me lately, you've been teaching me far more important things. Your grace is sufficient. I'll keep going on because after all, God, I've got to remember, like my Savior, I'm here to live for other people. In a second Corinthian commentary, in subtitled Gospel Under Siege, a man named Mitchell wrote in his this passage, the true story of a Chinese pastor who was very persecuted and was put in prison a number of times. His name was Lee Kuan. And the story goes that uh, Lee Kuan uh, found himself once again in a filthy, tiny, dirty jail cell. While he was there, he didn't know if his life was ended, didn't know if his ministry was over, but he personally prayed for a ministry while he was in prison. One day he called to the jailer. And the story goes, the jailer came over to him and said, what do you want? And Lee Kwan said, can I do some labor for you? Kwan said, in the jailer's eyes, surprise was mixed with contempt. He said, listen, this prison is so filthy. There is waste everywhere. The rats and roaches feed on it. You are not a prisoner, but you must feel like one. My father was a tremendous uh, cleaner. I can help you. Let me go into the cells one by one and clean up this filthy place. Give me water and a brush and soap. I will show you that I can do a good job like my father, who was a street sweeper, a great clear of the ground. The finest in China. And I am my father's son. Later, his American friend was allowed to visit him. Quan came out to the chain link fence, beaming with joy. They touched hands through the chain link fence. And his American friend said, you smell like soap. Yes, Quan beamed, his face and voice surprisingly animated. This is better than I smelled last time, yes? I have wonderful news. You must tell my family in my house church, God has answered prayer. He has given me a ministry. What? said the American. I go from cell to cell, bringing Jesus' message. But I thought you were in an isolated cell. Well, God opened the door. I go to the other men. Most have never had anyone else come into their cell except to beat them. I help and serve them as I clean their cells. I bring them the love of Jesus. Twelve men I have visited. When I left their cell, six I did not leave alone. What do you mean? When I left, Jesus was with them. That's a, a true story. I don't know about you, but I wonder if I would have wanted to go on. This man just simply prayed one day and said, Lord, if you're not done with me, would you let me live for others? You see, that's what Paul is saying is the uh, second point 
Number one, remember, what God's doing in you is always more important than what's happening to you. Number two, resolve to live for others. Number three, look at verse 16. Renew your inner life daily. Renew your inner life daily. Look at verse 16. For which cause we faint not. There it is. We don't quit. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. That word outward um, is the Greek word exo. Like exoskeleton. We all have an outward man. This, that part you're looking at right now. And you know what? It's perishing. <laughs> as hard as I try. Oh my. How about you guys? But listen, you need to remember that though your outward man is perishing, that's what death will bring one day. The inward man, the part, your spirit, the part that was bought also with a price, is being, look at this, renewed. Day by day. One day at a time. You and I look back. Um, there's a number of men and women in this room that are older than me. And, it, and, and I'm catching up. At least that's the way I feel. But you know, we look back, don't we? At the America we grew up in. The simple way we grew up. And you find yourself saying something like this. I'm glad I was born than when I was born. I'm glad I got to live... Even though it was, there were times that were tough. I'm glad I got to live when I lived. Listen, though the outward man and though the outward world is perishing, supernaturally inside we're getting younger and younger. Because God's getting us ready for everlasting eternal life. Now, if you and I aren't careful, we can get so worn down on the outside, we, are not, we let the inside get worn down too. And God says, don't do that. Paul says, stop. Don't do that. Let the Holy Spirit renew the inner man every day. In, in Romans 12, 1 and 2, you know those verses. You should. They're life verses for all believers. Paul tells us that we're to offer our bodies a living sacrifice. But in verse 2, he says, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed... By the renewing of your mind. We've talked so much about that in my time with you. Um, and having the indwelling Holy Spirit. And having the omniscient mind of God in print. There's no excuse for believers to give up. All we have to do is open our Bible. And you know, I don't know about you, but there are times, there are certain books I go to when I'm struggling. There are certain books I go to uh, for information. But you know what? This whole book has been preserved and given to us that we can open it up and go to God and say, God, I'm a little bit confused. In fact, I'll be honest, I need some answers. They'll be there. If we'll get on our knees and we'll pray and ask God and search this, the Spirit of God will help renew our mind. And guess what? When we get our mind renewed, something happens to our body. I guess I'll get up now. Thank you, Lord. I'll keep going on. Yeah, that outward man is perishing. But the inward man is being renewed day by day. Have you ever had this thought? I have. Could it be when I was tempted to quit? That was the day that I did not seek renewal. The day that you're... Listen, people have quit this church. I've been around long enough. Many of you have been here longer. People that were faithful and loyal and serving, they fainted, they quit. Could it have been the day they made the decision to stop moving forward for Christ and quit? That was the day that God was willing to renew them. But they said, no, no, I, I just can't take it anymore. God, I can't, I, can't, I can't feel or see anything you're doing inside of me anymore. I'm just horrified by what's happening to me. They decided, I'm not living for other people anymore. I'm, I'm, hung, I'm just going to lock the doors and... Hunker down till Jesus comes. And number three, they just stop being renewed. Do you realize you can't be renewed if you're not out serving? It doesn't work that way. But number four, verse 17. Remember, or excuse me, rest in the fact 
that we're only here temporarily. We're only here temporarily. Well, I tell you, when we start forgetting that, then we'll cast our eyes too strongly on life and go, oh my word, the bills, the pain, my loved ones. You just remember, we are only here temporarily. Paul said it this way. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Each day we live in ministry. Each day we live for Jesus Christ. We are headed toward a time when there won't be any more suffering and there's not going to be any more pain. And Paul had seen more than his share. Did he not, my brethren? Every person in this room. Some of you have been through some tough times. Me too. But none of us could ever write what Paul would share. And just, In fact, let me show you real quick. Keep your finger there. Turn over to chapter 11. Start in verse 23. You want to see what Paul refers to as a light affliction? Look at chapter 11, verses 23 through 28. He says, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant. In stripes above measure. Prisons more frequent. In deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. In wearings and painfulness and watchings often, and hunger and thirst and fastings often, and cold and nakedness. Besides those things that are without or outside my inner man, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Paul, you call that light affliction? He says, Yes when I think about heaven. Now I'm going to show you wordplay. Paul did this on purpose. Go back to our passage. Remember number four, we need to rest in the fact we're only here temporarily. Paul said you can take all the affliction. You can add it all up. And compared one day to the eternal, look at the word wait. Did you see the wordplay? He said, you can take all the pain and all the suffering and all the labor and the starvation and the attacks and the beatings and I was left for dead and, and I thought I was going to drown. I have no home. You can put all that together. And he says, it's nothing. Because one day, when I stand in heaven, oh, the weight. He's not being negative. He's saying, oh, the weight of the glory that I'm going to share with Jesus. He said, all this is just a light affliction. The word weight means to go down a low. But here he's being so positive. I look at that list in, in chapter 11 and I go, I don't know that I would want to keep living. Paul said, I'm not quitting until God takes me home. All that is just a light affliction. When I consider the weight of glory. Number one, you must realize that what God is doing in you is always more important than what's happening to you. Number two, you need to resolve to live your life for others. When you decide on a day, I'm done living for others, you're going to quit. Number three, you must renew your inner life daily. Let the Spirit of God and, and your prayer time and your Bible reading, just let God renew your life and renew your mind. Number four, rest in the fact that no matter what happens to you, it's just a light affliction. You're not here forever. It's just temporary in closing, verse 18. Number five, remember why you are here. Remember why you are here. Verse 18, Paul says, While we look, not at the things which are seen, 
but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You know that word look? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say the, the word that's translated look here. Scopeo. Scope. You use a scope to focus. Use a microscope to focus on what? Come on, talk to me. Things that you can't see without the aid of a microscope. You use a telescope to do what? See things that with the naked eye you can't normally see. Listen, God has given you tonight in His Word. He's given me. He's given us a promise that if we will use our spiritual vision. And we can see, and let me tell you, through messages like this tonight, your Bible reading, your quiet time with God, God allows us a supernatural ability to see the heavenly. To see the, what matters, what's eternal. And that'll keep you going. It did Paul. Up till now, it's helped you. It's helped me. Pastor Reed wrote this. The more important thing is not that my outward man be well, but that my inward man be well. You see, you didn't quit the work of God because you were physically tired. You quit because your inner man was not strong enough to go on. It wasn't the fact that you were hurt, but that you were not strong enough to bear the hurt. Tonight I will encourage you, church family, don't quit. Don't quit. We're all tempted. I'm looking at um, some of the most faithful of the faithful tonight at First Baptist. You're not given permission to quit. Neither am I. And my, my, by God's grace and by God's glory, for His glory. May we remember that seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. And to that end, all God's people say, Would you stand with me as we pray? And then I'll let you sit down. Ed, would you please come to the front? Heavenly Father, bless now. Thank you for being our strength, our Redeemer. Bless now in the proceedings. For your glory we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Brother Tom, we don't.